welcome everyone. You are uh, listening to the City Council work session for March 20, uh, March 2nd, 2021. And our first item is going to be the discussion related to supplemental transit services. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Darian Nagel-Gam, our transportation director, is going to walk you through this presentation today. Welcome. Good evening. Can you all hear me all right? Excellent. Okay, bear with me. I'm going to share my screen here. Let's get the screen situated. All right, are you able to see my presentation slide? Okay, great. All right. Um, good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, Council. I'm Darian Nagel-Gam, uh, Director of Transportation Services for the City of Iowa City, and I'm here to provide an update on the Iowa City Area Transit Study. So I'm not going to walk you through the whole timeline, uh, but just a few highlights. We launched the transit study in August of 2019 and uh, wanted to rewind you back to last fall, which is the last time I had an opportunity to present on the transit study. And at that point, um, we presented study recommendations to the council. Um, we, provide, or we received feedback regarding the preferred transit system design scenario. Um, the council provided feedback on fair recommendations and the priority of potential service enhancements. And uh, we presented nine different potential service enhancements that really are outside of what um, we are able to do within the scope of our current budget, our current staffing, our current resources, um, but really responded to the needs we heard from the community, from the community during the uh, transit study process. So last fall, you helped us narrow down um, that large list of potential ways that we can enhance our transit system and enhance mobility in the community with three um, priority items. And those were Sunday service, later evening service. So that's really service until midnight. And then what we call a night owl service. So that's more of an overnight um, type of service really geared towards third shift workers. So that's why I'm here tonight. Um, you would ask staff to come back with some potential options um, or some information on proposed um, ways we could provide, potentially provide services or partner to provide services for the community. That, uh, that address these priorities. And I'm going to um, walk you through some examples and some scenarios of how the community may um, proceed. All right, so first and foremost, um, the first thing that we really had to think about before um, we dug too far into what services might be available is to, to really develop some, some you know, ridership estimates. Um, and so I want to walk you through some of the assumptions behind those ridership estimates and then what those ridership estimates, these preliminary ridership estimates are. First off, we assumed all rides to be within um, the Iowa City limits. And of course, you know, at any time, you know, there could be discussions about extending that uh, reach outside of Iowa City. But for the purposes of this analysis, we just assumed that all rides um, would be taking place within the Iowa City limits. We developed some of these ridership estimates um, because, of course, we don't have these are not services we provide currently. So we really had to reach out to um, our transportation partners and other communities who are providing services that meet some of these um, service gaps that we've identified here and um, to get some sense of what ridership might look like. And I'll and I'll walk you through a little bit more about that in just a moment. And lastly, I just wanted to make sure you're aware that really ultimately, you know, ridership is affected by multiple factors. It's really going to be affected by the type of service that is offered to a customer. It's very much going to be affected by the fare, the more expensive um, the fare, the, the less the ridership, generally speaking. Um, you know, ease of access to the service. Is there an app that someone can um, use uh, to, to, to access a service? Is there an app that tells you how the service works, for example, our transit app, those sorts of things. Those are the, the more you can reduce barriers, the easier it is for people to utilize that service. Of course, um, there could also be program qualifiers. Some communities have um, uh, income qualifiers, for example. Those would affect ridership. 
And then last but certainly not least, you know, recovery from the pandemic is, is never far from our mind. Um, it's on the horizon. We're excited about it. Um, but the truth is currently we are, you know, we're down 65% um, based on where we were before from a fixed route perspective. So we know we have, um, we, we have a, the, we're feeling the effects of the pandemic um, and, and it'll just be unknown as to how we rebuild um, um, ridership going forward. So things to be aware of and things to consider. If you turn your attention to the table I have here, so I just wanted to walk you through these ridership estimates that we have developed. The first of which is trout um, service on Sunday. So this is one thing we heard loud and clear from the community. And the estimate um, that we developed for ridership would be up to 3,700 riders daily. And how we arrive and daily means on, on a particular Sunday. Um, we reached out to the community of Ames who went through a very similar transit study process that we are going through right now, same consultant team as well. And um, they have uh, Sunday service that is uh, a mirror image of their Saturday service. And they indicated that their pre-pandemic Sunday service was about 72% of their um, uh, Saturday service level. So that's how we arrived. We applied that same ratio to our pre-pandemic average Saturday service levels. And that's where we you know, estimated that we could have um, up to 3,700 riders uh, on a daily basis. So that would be on a typical Sunday. Annually, that looks like 192,400 riders over the course of a year. Now, the next on the list is Sunday demand response. So this is more of a um, you call to request a ride type of service. And again, uh, we don't have the service currently. So in order to, to make some assessments of what you know ridership might look like, we reached out to our transportation partners in Cedar Rapids. They do have a partnership. The transit system does have a partnership. Um, with, a, with an agency that does provide on-demand, off-transit hour transportation service. And this is, this is about what their service looks like factored down for the population of, of Iowa City on a typical Sunday. So a, a daytime typical Sunday, um, we could expect approximately 100 riders. Now, why such a difference between fixed route and on-demand? Fixed route is, you know, it's a, it's a community, it's a usually a very well-known community asset. People look here first for their transportation needs. Um, demand response, uh, you, A, you don't have the capacity that you might with a fixed route service, but B, um, often it is, um, it is more limited in the, the scope. You're able to provide the number of people you're able to serve. Um, and, um, uh, you know, people don't, don't often know about it as easily as you might the transit system and quite frankly you might be able to you're just not able to support the number of riders you would be with, with fixed with fixed route transit so that um that scenario a demand response scenario we were working on the assumption we'd have about 100 riders on every sunday and that would be about 5200 riders per year the third service enhancement that we looked at was late evening service. And we looked at it from a fixed route perspective. So if Iowa City Transit was able to extend all routes that um, uh, in operation in the evening to midnight. Um, and looking at our evening ridership before the pandemic, looking at our evening ridership with all of our routes um, running to midnight, we're working on the assumption we could serve 470 more riders per night up until midnight, and that would look like approximately 171 uh, point, uh, 171,500 uh, riders per year. Now, during that same scenario, that same time frame, that late evening time frame, if we looked at a demand response scenario, ridership would look very different based on um, based on what we're hearing, um, uh, what we hear from the community in, in Cedar Rapids, at least how how their application works. Um, we uh, assume we'd have probably 30 riders or so in the late evening between when transit wraps up and midnight. Um, and over the, and that's daily. So over the course of a year, that would look like um, almost 11,000 um, total riders could be served with that, with that service. And last but not least is our, our night owl. Um, so that's um, overnight service. Um, that's typically demand response um, in many communities. We're working on the assumption we'd um, again, um, uh, based on what we learned from the city of Cedar Rapids, there'd probably be about 20 riders served per night. And over the course of the year, that would that would equal out to about 7,200 um, riders annually. I had a quick question about the sure. times related to the late evening service. Hmm? 
can you state those again? Sure. So uh, we have we're currently working under two um, operations. So our current operations um, they turn off at different times. So we don't have a set time where our where our transit system shuts down. We have routes that um, that end um, depending on the particular needs of that route and our funding, our resources. Anywhere between six o'clock and I think eleven o'clock is our latest route now. If you look at the, the transit system scenario recommendations that we are expecting to be implementing this summer, um, the recommendations, the, the consultant team really helped us really stretch out every last dollar that we have. So we don't have a hard um, reset for, for evening service. It's, it's really different by route. We do have five routes. Our latest routes um, would run until midnight under the, the recommendations from the, excuse me, the five, we have five routes that would run until 10 o'clock under the recommendations from the consultant team. And then we, the remainder of the routes would really turn off between 9.30, 9.15, 8.30, 8.15, down to seven o'clock and 6.30. So it's really, it's dependent on the route. So um, if that's helpful. Yes, thank you. Yes. Okay, so um, let's talk about potential service um, options. So um, we reached out to um, um, our local transportation partners, to um, more corporate structure par um, transportation partners that are that are functioning in our community, and we've come up with seven different potential options um, that could be employed in Iowa City to help um, serve some of the gaps, the transportation gaps that folks in, in the community are experiencing. Um, I'll walk through these really briefly, and then I'm going to go through them each in a little bit more detail. But first and foremost, Iowa City Transit, of course, that was uh, first on the list. So uh, we have the potential to expand our services to help uh, meet um, needs from the community. And we certainly heard um, that uh, requested through the transit study process. Neighborhood Transportation Service, or you might refer to them, or you might hear them referred to as Horizons. Um, that is the agency that partners with um, the city of Cedar Rapids to provide off transit hours demand response service, and um, it's usually in a van pool um, format. Johnson County Seats, which also I'm sure sounds very familiar um, to you all. We've already partnered with them, Johnson County, and uh, provides paratransit transit services for the city of Iowa City, um, um, our complimentary uh, paratransit transit services. So we inquired about you know, a potential expansion of services, and I'll provide some more details on that. Um, yellow cab also probably looks very familiar to everyone in this room. We've all seen uh, the yellow cabs around town. Um, they provide taxi on demand um, and demand response services. We also reached out to Lyft and Uber. Um, both agencies um, have begun to uh, uh, partner with transit agencies to help fill um, gaps in, in transfer, uh, transportation services. Um, very similar. It's a transportation network company so that there's no local ownership. There's no uh, um, you know, central location here, they're all contracted drivers um, in using personal vehicles. And then last but not least, um, we developed a scenario that's really a partnership um, between Iowa City Transit and um, VIA, meaning uh, VIA actually is a micromobility app company or a micromobility service company. We would actually take on um, uh, the micromobility platform that they use to help provide on-demand services um, to the community. So I'm gonna walk you through each one of these in a little bit more detail. First and foremost, Iowa City Transit, of course, um, how it works, you know, it's a fixed route with set schedules. So the routes do not change, um, the schedules do not change. There's dedicated bus stops. Um, people um, can go to the bus stops to pick up a ride. We use bus passes, cash fare. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Johnson County Seats provides our complimentary paratransit services. And um, in the scenarios that we've developed, um, Sunday service um, would mirror the proposed Saturday service with 11 routes functioning on an hourly schedule, which is nearly double the service that we have on Saturday today. So that's a big change in and of itself, um, it, you know, just on Saturdays, but expanding that to Sundays. Um, um, would be a, a pretty significant increase in um, the available uh, transportation service for the community. The later evening service would involve running all 11 um, routes that we typically run 
um, during the evenings until midnight. Um, from those various times that I cited earlier, each route, um, we have a few that, that close at, at 10 in the proposal. That's our latest scenario. The rest of them kind of close, um, you know, uh, earlier depending on route ridership needs. Um, but in that scenario, all would, would go till midnight. The benefits, of course, are community familiarity. Um, it's a $1 ride. It's very inexpensive. It's uh, lower cost um, if you qualify for reduced fare. And it really, you know, utilizing or expanding the transit service would really address um, top community priorities that we heard loud and clear through the transit study. Expansion could also better serve um, our current riders and would clearly also help attract um, new riders, which is, is the stated goal. We really are aiming for, you know, doubling ridership within 10 years. The pandemic curveball that's been thrown our way, might, we might, uh, that might be a challenge, but that's really our goal is to better serve who we have, our riders today, um, and also better prepare the system to attract more riders. So in terms of challenges with Iowa City Transit, it's of course, by, uh, by definition, it's less flexible than on-demand or demand response. So um, it's, it's not, uh, there's a route and a schedule um, and that, that guides um, the public's transportation decisions in this system and in this scenario. You know, buses will be on the road, whether there's riders or not. And of course, we would need to expand staffing and develop new schedules to um, to uh, expand um, transit service either to Sunday or to later in the evening. All right, so in terms of uh, developing the cost estimates, the first thing that, that we, um, we took a look at was the startup needs. So we'll talk a little bit about that for each example. And ours would clearly be staffing. Um, we do have the buses um, that are not, they're not used on Sunday. So we have, uh, we have the capacity, uh, excuse me, we have the capital and the capacity um, from a vehicle perspective staffing would be um, the, the need that, uh, that we would need um, in order to get um, service running and even into the evening as well. We have um, the bus, we have the buses, we have the, um, the vehicles we need to provide service, but it would be staffing would be um, what we would need to, to start. So I'm just gonna walk you through um, the high level cost estimates here. So for Sunday service, um, annually speaking, um, it, it would be expected to cost $780,000 to provide fixed route service on Sunday to mirror the recommended um, uh, Saturday service. So that would be running um, all 11 routes on hourly service. If uh, the community wanted uh, to expand transit service late in the evening, which meant all routes up until midnight every day of the week, that would be $1 million, $1,060,000 for, for those total estimated costs. If, if the community wanted to look at just late evening service on weekdays where the demand might be the greatest during the evenings, um, running service till midnight would cost approximately $540,000. Um, and also again, late evening on Saturdays, um, the estimate there would be $260,000. And we did not evaluate a night owl overnight service using fixed route. It would be pretty unusual uh, for a community of this size to, to run fixed route um, overnight. It's usually, um, it's usually determined that those resources are best spent investing in, in higher frequency, better service during the daytime when there's more um, opportunity for use. All right, so we talked about Iowa City Transit. We're turning our attention to the Neighborhood Transportation Service or Horizons, NTS for short. How this works, it's a van pool service. It's shared rides. Like I mentioned before, it serves the Cedar Rapids Metro off transit hours. So it's evening, overnight, and on Sundays. Riders, in, in their scenario, riders pay $6 per trip. Um, the, the rest is subsidized by the city. They schedule, so a rider would schedule a day in advance or up to one hour in advance up until January. Um, actually, Horizons and NTS has just adopted the VIA app and the micromobility platform, which allows them to function on demand. So they've seen um, a big increase in, um, in, in, in ridership uh, requests at certain times of the day because they now have an app, which makes it, again, really easy for, for people to access um, the transportation. It's how their partnership is worked out. It's open to the public and there's no income qualifiers. However, I suspect that the $6 per, per trip is, is somewhat of an income qualifier by, by, by uh, definition. 
um, but they do um, also provide paratransit service. Um, so that would not be something that would need to be considered or outsourced to another agency. So in terms of benefits, you know, it's lower co overall cost and fixed route service. The, the app is really great. Um, you can also use a phone to book a ride. So it's not, um, you know, it's not one or the other. There's both options, which is really ideal. Um, they can provide demand response, which is really the technical trans transportation wonky term for scheduled. Um, or they can do the on-demand service um, with the app, which is really nice to have that flexibility. You never know what's going to come up um, in your day and, um, you know, you might need you know, might need service within a few minutes um, unexpectedly. They do have curb to curb service, um, of course, with the van pool, um, multi-passenger rides, um, how, they, how they run their operations, I think are more economical um, than maybe a single passenger ride. And, you know, they've had a 25 year partnership with the Cedar, city of Cedar Rapids for their off transit hours transportation service. So those are some of the benefits. In terms of the challenges, um, the vehicles and office space would need to be procured um, prior to expansion to Iowa City. Um, and I do want to talk a little bit about fare. So as I mentioned, you know, Cedar Rapids, um, how, their, how their agreement has worked out is to use this service, it's a $6 charge. These fares are just, um, they're completely set by the communities. Um, it's like what the community is willing to um, enable to support um, what, the, what the community needs um, in terms of a fare. So, for simplicity, for the next examples that you're going to see, um, for all of them, we're, we we developed the cost based on a two dollar fare. So we just doubled our typical transit fare, um, and um, we're we're using that. You can really find the gamut in communities as to what the uh, charges for these kind of accessory add-on services are. Um, but we we model all of these off of two dollars per fare. All right, and last but not least, costs. So as I as I mentioned, startup needs for for NTS specifically would be we the vehicles would need to be procured and they would need to locate office space in Iowa City. So vehicles we're assuming would be approximately um, 219,000, um, and then again finding that office space. In terms of providing Sunday service, um, the estimated cost for providing daytime service would be about $92,000 a year. The later evening service if provided on a daily basis, um, would the, the cost estimate is $357,000. And then to provide that overnight service, so that's really that midnight to 6 a.m. service, the estimate is $321,000. All right, the third type of uh, transportation service um, and transportation provider we looked at was Johnson County Seats. And how it works today is qualified riders call or they can use the Amble app um, to schedule rides and it's typically a day in advance is when those rides are scheduled. They do provide curb to curb service. Um, they would potentially utilize the existing 13 vehicle air transit fleet. Um, the benefits is that seats already provides transportation services to the community. So they're very familiar with the community. We're very familiar with them. The city already owns and maintains the paratransit vehicle fleet. Um, and of course, because they are uh, paratransit experts, um, paratransit service would clearly be included in any potential partnership. Some of the challenges with Johnson County seats would be that customers must have an account um, set up with seats um, in order to use the Amble app. So if you were a public rider, if this was a public um, partnership or a public system that we set up, um, public riders would need to use the phone to schedule a ride or they'd have to set up an account and it's just kind of another hurdle um, that would make it a challenge um, for, for using an app. And there's also just a general concern about putting mileage on paratransit vehicles for non-paratransit rides. As you might imagine, these vehicles are more expensive than, um, than other vehicles which could potentially be used to provide, um, provide rides. So um, a general concern uh, to be noted about that. As I mentioned, we modeled these cost estimates using a $2 fare. Um, and um, in terms of the startup needs that Johnson County seats mentioned to us, um, in order to provide late night or overnight service, they would need to hire a supervisor. So we indicated those costs would be approximately $89,000 to hire a new supervisor. Sunday service um, cost estimates were um, approximately $172,000 with later evening daily service at um, $361,000. And then the night owl overnight service, the cost estimate was approximately 
All right, moving on to number four, yellow cab. So how does yellow cab work? So riders request a ride by phone only uh, and they must call about 30 minutes in advance. Um, North Liberty does have a partnership with yellow cab currently. And so some details on how their partnership works, the community provides IDs um, to eligible, um, um, eligible or qualified passengers. They pay a dollar fare um, and then the city subsidizes uh, the remaining amount. They also have eligible trip locations, including grocery stores, medical facilities, government buildings, et cetera. Again, showing um, these partnerships can really be set up in any way um, at, that the community wishes to set them up uh, with monthly invoicing to the city. The benefits are that there is curb to curb service. The fleet does include an accessible vehicle. They have several accessible vehicles, um, which could provide complimentary paratransit service um, and yellow cab is relatively low cost. In terms of challenges, there's there's not an app, um, which is becoming increasingly leaned on as, um, as uh, not everybody has a smartphone, but there's a really great number of the population that does um, have a smartphone and it, and it does make um, things easier from a ride request perspective. So um, if, if, because there's no app, riders would have to um, request a ride by phone. Um, and, you know, just a general concern also about meeting the service demand without strict eligibility requirements, that might be a challenge for Yellow Cab. Again, we modeled these cost estimates with a $2 fare. They did not indicate to us any particular startup needs, um, but we were um, we calculated the, um, the annual potential cost estimates for Sunday service to be around $57,000. The late evening service would be approximately $120,000 um, annually, and then the overnight or the night owl service would be approximately $80,000. All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, Lyft, which is a transportation network company. Um, I'll go through this and Ubers fairly briefly because they're very similar, um, functionally speaking, but how Lyft works is riders request a ride using the Lyft app, or they have a platform um, for transit agencies that, um, um, you could some you could call somebody could call in and somebody else could book a ride for them, um, but I'd say the vast majority of users are using an app to 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 get a ride from Lyft. Um, income qualified riders could enter a code to receive a discounted fare to get a two dollar fare. They could enter a code. Um, the drivers are independent contractors. They work on Lyft's behalf to provide the ride, and Lyft would then would invoice the city monthly for the remaining balance. Um, based on the criteria that we set up. So benefits, curb to curb service, you could link to Lyft through the transit app. You can actually do that today. Um, when, if you, you put in a couple um, directions, um, your location where you're going to right now into the transit app, it shows you transit routes, shows you walking time, it shows you biking time. And then it also shows you how much it would cost to, um, to take a Lyft or an Uber right now. So it's already kind of embedded into our transit app. The service clearly already exists in our community. Um, it's, it's out there that independent contractors are working. It is uh, relatively low cost. Uh, those without smartphones can still access the service and they do have um, some transit planning and reporting um, and administrative tools. The challenges with Lyft is that they don't have accessible vehicles um, nor a source of accessible vehicle drivers to draw from. So really paratransit services would need to be outsourced um, there's no real oversight of drivers um, you know, and no clear indication of supply of available vehicles. So there's not really a guarantee that if somebody's requesting a ride at three in the morning that somebody will be there um, um, to pick them up. Um, we would need to set up a call-in process for riders without smartphones or who are unfamiliar with the app. As I mentioned, that's a, that's a the benefit, but also that would be something that we would need to, to take on and integrate into our operations. And there is potential for discount code abuse, of course. And you know they can limit the code usage to certain times of the day. They can limit the code usage to one use or two uses per um, per IP address. But you know there's still that potential for for discount code abuse um, potentially. 
in terms of startup needs, um, in terms of Lyft, it's already functioning in, in the community. So there's really no startup need necessary, but paratransit service would need to um, be started up to complement um, complement um, the Lyft service. So we've included um, the paratransit cost in the annual cost um, estimate, service cost estimate. So Sunday service, the estimate is $50,000 to provide um, daytime service on Sundays, late evening service on weekday, or actually not weekdays, all days, um, that the estimate is 105,300. And on um, the overnights, the night owl, um, we're, we're estimating the cost would be about $70,000. All right, Uber, like I said, very similar. It's a transportation network company. I did like to, uh, I wanted to separate these out. Um, some. Um, People use one more than the other, so I wanted to identify that these are both available options for us to partner with, but really they're very similar. You call in a ride uh, or you request a ride using an app. Um, they could potentially call us as well. If you enter a code, you'd get that reduced fare and you know, independent contractors. Benefits are all the same. It's curb to curb. You can link um, to Uber. It's service clearly already exists in the community. Um, it is low cost and, and those without a smartphone can and still access it, which is great news. All of the same challenges, the accessibility is the biggest challenge with any TNC um, transportation network company um, partnership. Um, and uh, you know we'd have to pull together a process for the callers and, and there's always that kind of looming potential for discount code abuse um, that, that, that would be of concern. Um, in terms of costs, these look very familiar because they are exactly the same as, as Lyft's cost. So $50,000 um, for Sunday service, late evening service, we're estimated at $105,300, um, and then $70,000 for the overnight service. All right, last example, last but not least. So this, um, again, would be a partnership. Um, this would be an Iowa City Transit service, I should say. I'm using the, the VIA micromobility platform. So how it works is the city employees would provide the transportation. City would need to purchase and employ the VIA platform to enable on-demand transportation. Um, we would need to install GPS-enabled tablets in all vehicles. We do that now with our, with our buses as part of our um, advanced vehicle locator systems. Um, riders would request a ride using the app or they would call us by phone and we could book a ride for them. And the, the, the genius of this system and this, this micromobility app is that it really strategically routes the vehicles to op optimize service, reduce travel time and cost on the fly. So the system knows at any given time, the location of all of the vehicles, where they're going, the location of all the people requesting rides, where they're going, and it matches them together. So it optimizes um, transportation um, choices for uh, to get people where they're going in, in the fastest, most convenient um, way and the most efficient and low cost way possible. And like I said, this is also the same platform that a neighborhood transportation services has just uh, moved to. So the city would pay the installation fee to help with the setup and then there's a per vehicle monthly charge. That's how, the, that's how that system works. The benefits is that it's really highly customizable. It's on, uh, it's on demand, you can schedule rides. It does a lot of things. It can be used for passenger vans, minivans. You could even, some transit systems are even running um, on demand 40 foot buses um, during their low, um, low ridership periods, like on Sundays or later evenings. Um, vehicles, like I mentioned, ma are matched to riders based on their location, destination, and staff has access to um, operations planning tools and a dashboard. So there's, there's good planning. Um, features and operations features built in. So challenges in conceptualizing what it would look like for you know, Iowa City to foray into on-demand service. One of the first things that came to mind was you know, heated storage for vehicles, which um, uh, has really been on the mind uh, in the last few weeks, um, or just heat in general. Um, so yeah, we've had some real challenges getting the buses rolling or keeping them rolling um, during the extreme cold weather. And, and not having, we are maxed out capacity wise um, here at our facility. So that would be a challenge for us to figuring out where to put these um, vehicles at, where to launch operations from. So that's the first concern. And, and then generally speaking, you know, just integrating on demand operations into a fixed, mount, a fixed route operation. It, it, it's just, it's a different way to look at things. 
Um, and so it would be a challenge to, to bring those together, not insurmountable by any means, but it's, um, it would be a, a different way to provide, it'd be additional, be a very different way of Iowa City Transit to be providing support. So, um, again, modeling that $2 fare, startup needs for this, um, we would estimate the cost for vehicles to be about $276,500. Um, that's for vehicles and all of the tablets, the, the cameras, all of what we call the make ready costs to get um, the vehicles um, rolling. That would also include um, the installation of the VIA micromobility platform to enable um, us to provide on demand service. Sunday service would estimate it would be an estimated $188,000. Later evening service on a daily basis um, over the cost over the course of a year would be approximately three hundred and thirty eight thousand dollars. And then if you're looking at the night owl service. Um, in addition to that, that would be approximately three hundred and ten thousand um, dollars for annual services. All right, so um, thank you for bearing with me. I know I just <laughs> put a lot of information um, out to you um, in a pretty rapid time frame and you know we presented seven different ways that we could we can enhance education and mobility for the community. Some of the options are fixed route. Um, so it's expanding our bus system and our bus operations. There's some you know on demand options that um, we could use from, from local transportation services um, you know or we can provide service in house um, ourselves. As you might um, imagine and might notice uh, when you see all of these next to each other, there is a pretty significant cost difference between the options and, and those differences really can be attributed to the you know, quality of service, um, the reliability, the um, oversight, um, you know, more control over level of service, that sort of thing. So those are some of the things that we consider when we look at this list and that I'm sure um, you will consider as well. Another thing um, I'm sure you're thinking when you look at this list is funding, uh, you know, so, uh, so, you know, how will we potentially fund, uh, you know, any of these options. And we feel that we could successfully pilot services that you wish to pursue with um, FTA funds that we've received in response to COVID to date, um, just to give you some perspective on what that looks like. To date, we have received um, authorization for uh, 6 million, approximately $6 million. Um, we've spent uh, 1.5 million of that to um, support our operations over the last year. We expect by the end of this fiscal year, we will have spent another uh, 1.5, 1.6 $1 million of those funds. Um, that would leave approximately 3 million in, um, in funds, um, the unexpected funds we, we received from the FTA. And then we, you know, there's a potential that we could receive additional funding. The, the, the COVID relief package that's working its way through the Congress right now, which has not been authorized yet, but there's a potential to receive, you know, uh, several million more dollars. We just don't know what that's going to look like um, at, at this time. And the last item for consideration is, is really a, a recommendation. So we looked at all, uh, we've been living and breathing all of those different options, uh, you know, and, and what could be a good fit for the community. We wanted to offer staff recommendations for consideration. And uh, the recommendation is really that, um, that we engage with a two year pilot for fixed route bus service on Sundays. And the reasons for that is that it really addresses the unmet demand for public transportation on Sundays. And it was, it was the most requested enhancement we heard um, in the transit study with the thought that we could revisit after two years, see where we're at, um, it would give um, what seems like uh, some good recovery time from, from a COVID perspective and also really give us time to um, establish service and just build ridership. So as I mentioned um, earlier, the Sunday service um, would mirror Saturday service. So there'd be 11 routes running hourly service from 7 a.m. to 7.30 p.m which is um, great because it's nearly double um, the, uh, the capacity that we have currently right now today on Saturdays. So it would be, it would be, a, it would be quite a different um, uh, service for the community. And I think it could do, I think it could be, I think it could do a really good thing, um, not just on Sunday, but clearly that expanded capacity on Sunday, or excuse me, on Saturday would also be, uh, would also help meet the needs of the community. 
it also, you know, expanding our transit service to Sunday also really, really reinforces our climate action goals. Um, you know, one of, one of the many goals in that plan is to enable a shift of 55% of vehicle trips to more sustainable modes by 2050. So that's a pretty specific goal. Um, and that's a good challenge, but I think, you know, trying to reach that goal on, on a six day a week system might be, might be a challenge. I mean, it might take seven days a week um, system to get people, um, you know, on board and um, using transit um, as one of the more sustainable modes um, to meet that 55% um, goal. And again, the annual estimated costs um, for that service, um, for Sunday service fixed route would be $780,000 a year. And we estimate um, that would um, bring in an additional 192,000 um, plus thousand riders um, to the transit system on an annual basis. Now, if, you know, more service is desired, uh, we offer a, a recommendation for um, later evenings or overnight service. So in the instance that, that we wish to, to help provide some more additional transportation during those times, we recommend partnering with uh, NTS and Horizons to provide that late night overnight transportation service. So clearly that would support late night or third shift workers. Service would begin when the transit service ends and run until 6 a.m. There would be um, shared curb to curb service during the evening um, hours for qualified riders, and they could provide a demand response scheduled um, or an on demand service. And it's really easy uh, to book a ride using the app or to call by phone. So there's there's lots of options. And really, I know that, you know this just really stood out. They've just had a really long and successful partnership with the city of Cedar Rapids, and and they've gotten really great feedback. Um, when I've reached out to um, transportation partners in Cedar Rapids regarding how that how that works in their community. So uh, the estimated cost for, for that overnight, that late night and overnight service um, together would be $648,000 plus um, startup costs for vehicles, which we estimated to be about $219,000. And the estimate is that that would provide service, um, transportation service for about 18,200 um, riders per year. So combined, the two of those um, together would be about $1.4 million for year, for, per year, excuse me. So tonight, um, again, we're just um, asking for your thoughts and direction on these potential um, transportation enhancements, and I would be happy to answer any questions um, you might have. Mayor, if I may uh, jump in and just add to, to Darian's final comments there. When you consider a pilot program, um, I just want, want to make sure you're thinking about a few things. One, you've got to make sure it, to the best that you can at this point. I know we're talking uh, uh, two years out here, but you, you've got to feel pretty comfortable um, in committing these funds down the road. Don't do a pilot project that's going to cost 1.5 million if you really don't feel like there's going to be an appetite to, to establish permanent funding sources to support the program. And, and that's one thing that makes me um, candidly a little nervous about the, 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 the night owl component of this and the late night is if you just look at the cost of that service uh, for the riders, it's, it's a very expensive service. And you have to kind of put your, you have to kind of think ahead a couple of years and say, if that is indeed, you know, the, the ridership that we see and the cost that we see, do you think there would be a, an appetite to um, raise a property tax levy or an act of utility tax, wh whatever it's going to have to be to support that, that level of service. So I want to make sure you're, you're thinking about that because you will have a difficult conversation ahead of you in two years. Um, regardless of, of, of whether we hit these numbers or, or we exceed them a little bit. And then you also have to kind of think of the flip side. If, if, if you don't, um, uh, if you decide in two years that the, that the services just weren't worth the, the money that was being invested, you have to think about the process of deconstructing the service too. So um, for a city operated system, that means different things than it would be, you know, for example, on the other end of the spectrum with an Uber or a Lyft. It'd be very easy for us to terminate a contract with Uber or Lyft. Um, when you're talking about a city provided services, those are our employees, that's, that's our vehicles. 
Um, that could mean layoffs. Uh, that could mean you know disposing of those vehicles, which is just a, a different type of process. So I know we're at the early stages of, of, of taking on this pilot, but I encourage you to think about the decision that'll be ahead of the council in a couple of years as well. Well, thanks to both of you. So council, just jump right on in there. I'll, I'll start out, Darian, I just want to confirm. So the the add on for the late evening and overnight annual cost of 648,000 and then estimating 18,200 um, new or I guess 18,200 riders. If I, I just divide the annual cost by the number of riders, that's $35.60 per rider. Is that that's, right? That's, that, that's accurate. It's right in the ballpark, yes. Okay, all right. Just want to make sure I had that math right. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, Darian and I went, uh, we spent a lot of time talking about those numbers. Um, and it's our best guess. That's all we can say. And and you know, ridership numbers may be different here than they are in Cedar Rapids. Um, so it, it could be that you know that number drops down to twenty, or it could be a little bit more. But um, it's definitely a, a very expensive service to, to operate with that type of with that type of system. There's a ton of benefits for it, no doubt about it. But it's expensive. With the Uber and Lyft, um, using both of those services, would that be an option? And the cost still be average the same between the two? That's a great question. So so the, the costs were estimated based on the average ride cost in Iowa City, which is about $9. The average ride, if you're using Uber or Lyft in Iowa City is $9. So I would say that even if it was a partnership with both of them to try to maximize the supply of available drivers, um, yes, I would say that the estimates would probably be about the same. If the demand, if the demand was the same, if the ridership estimates were the same, then uh, yeah, it would be about the same in terms of the cost. Okay. What about with yellow cab? I mean, I, I guess I'm just thinking if if we were not to use Horizon for the late night, if we were to use the more on demand, individual on demand, show I guess my concern is showing favoritism to the network companies versus the taxi company. What could it look like or would it be feasible to contract with all three of those? I can honestly say I had not thought about that. Um, so that's a good question. Um, I think the only the the only thing that might get muddled in the messaging to the public is is that there would potentially be too many options and it might be confusing um, for the public. I think we could manage it on the back end. It's really, you know, setting up the system and you know they would they would invoice us for for the cost minus whatever the fare um, that, the, that, the, that the customer paid. It could be confusing for, for customers to, to have multiple options. Um, I mean, it could potentially expand the, um, the supply available, but I think that, that's the first drawback that comes to mind. Darian, could you go back to the, um, the recommendation slide, please? Sure. So, I mean, I, it seems that the, um, you know, that fixed route bus service on Sunday seems like, you know, a, a really good foundation. And then the, the question of late evening overnight service is, is a question. I mean, that $35 per ride was, that's, that's a pretty overwhelming number, it seems. Um, but, you know, as in other areas of, of uh, city services, I, I would be interested to know, 
you know, what the experience of comparable cities to Iowa City have done, you know, what kind of systems they have in place, if they've tried some of these alternatives for the late, late evening overnight services and, you know, what the outcomes were. Um, maybe I'm just suffering a little bit here from information overload, but <laughs> it's kind of hard to uh, take it, take that piece of it all in and understand what, you know, what the, what the alternatives would be to the, the cost of this NTS Horizons partnership. Um, but it does seem that the fixed route bus service seems like a really good foundation. And then I would, I would be interested to understand how other cities, if they've, if they've had such late evening overnight services have addressed it and what, what we can learn from their experience. I have another question in terms of that late night, late evening, overnight. And I took all the notes, but I'm not sure if I got all this. Is, I guess my question is, are we, with this proposal basically, is this late evening, overnight available to anybody and everybody and the city is subsidizing it no matter who that person is or how much money that person makes? That is a great question. So really, it's up to um, it's up to us. Um, uh, we would be able to set whatever um, requirements um, we wish to set. Many communities have income qualifiers um, um, for their you know specialty kind of on demand supplemental services. Um, you know, in the in the instance of Cedar Rapids, uh, I think they set their fare in such a way that it um, it. Maybe it provides the service, but it's just to those who absolutely need the service at six dollars a fare um, um, for you know NTS and Cedar Rapids. So there's yeah, there's you could really set it up any way um, possible. We could have um, you know income qualifiers. We could have an application process. Um, you know, making it as simple as possible, or making it as complex as as we feel comfortable with. I guess when I hear that. One of the things that I would be interested in having us think about and consider is if, if we are going to try and do the late evening and overnight, which I think is a big need, especially for those third shift workers and people, you know, in that situation, that if the city is going to put a lot of money into this, it really is an income qualified situation that people would have that opportunity to apply, there would be some income verification. Um, and maybe in many of those cases, it would also help with our cost because it might be people who are leaving the same employer at the same point in time or going to the same employer at the same point in time. Um, one that hopefully could help to keep our costs maybe reduced and secondly, really serve the people who need this the most. Um, who aren't going to have their own car, don't have two cars in the household for different jobs, you know, whatever it might be. So. If, if we are going to consider the late evening and overnight, I'd like for us to think about how we really focus on that service on the people most in need. I agree with Susan on that, because I think that's who we heard from the most. I mean, for years we've been hearing about the need uh, to uh, assess our, our transportation system and and in fact that's why what prompted the council to approve a consultant to, to look into this and I think it might have even been Susan um, you a while back that uh, had recommended some type of voucher system perhaps with with the taxi cabs and I think uh, we could do that and that would be based on income because those are the folks that quite likely most likely do need some assistance to get to those um, jobs that are overnight. I just want to uh, come on a little bit here. Yes, I know that it is good comment from Susan and uh, Pauline about uh, evaluating the people and make sure they are, uh, you know, qualify for these services. But the, you know, if you have a car, that doesn't mean you, you can have afford a gas for the car. I don't think this have to be uh, like evaluated. But low income, definitely, I support both of. Uh, the thing, yeah, have to be low income people. Thank you.
Well, we, we don't have to run these things in, in parallel, at least the decision making process. If folks felt very comfortable with the Sunday service, we could get going on the implementation planning for that. There's some staffing uh, puzzles that, that Darian and her staff need to work through. Um, and, and we could come back to you uh, and refine these alternative options with, with a premise that there's gonna be some income verification. And, and you'll see those numbers adjust I think quite a bit if if uh, if that's the desire of the council. So with the if we just go with Sunday services, my my only concern is we heard from a lot of the people in the community where you know they're working and and that late night service is a challenge. Um, yeah, I, if I, we were, sorry, Mayor. Oh, go right ahead, please. Yeah, I, I, just to clarify, I was saying we could go go ahead and implement the, the the Sunday service now, or begin working towards that goal now. And if income qualification is desired by by the majority of council, then we should really come back to you and refine some of these partnership scenarios because we did not we did not make that assumption coming into this work session. So we just may not we we may need to revisit this discussion with with some reframed numbers. I wonder, would it be helpful if uh, council kind of gave you gave direction on um, which provider they're looking at it? It sounded like, um, you know, we we had we, we heard from, a, you know, about all these providers and what would seem like the most, you know, maybe one or two that council is leaning towards. I did like Councillor Thomas when he, when he may mention just looking at the other communities and getting some information so that we're, you know, we have something to go off of. Um, Gary, you mentioned having compared with Ames. Was there ridership information that was recent enough that they also have Uber and Lyft operating in their communities, so there's not a issue of like that um, those services sort of taking the place of any of that on demand, if that makes sense? It's a good question. I don't know for certain whether they have Uber and Lyft operating in their community. I would assume that they do uh, because they're a university community. And I think the state actually uh, passed legislation which doesn't allow communities to outright um, prohibit them from operating in their communities. That's my understanding. So I'm working on the assumption that they have um, the similar amount of transportation options available um, to the community that we do. One point of difference I would mention is that Ames has one transit system. So City of Iowa City, uh, we are a three agency system here. So of course we have CAN bus, we have um, Corville Transit. Um, however, um, you know, in trying to imagine how that might affect our ridership, um, really, we still took that 72% ratio that they said that, you know, they operate 72% of their ridership on Saturdays on Sundays, we thought that would still apply just even, you know, if you're narrowed that focus just down to our segment of transit um, for the community. So uh, relatively speaking, I, I get the sense that we're functionally very similar in that respect. And, and Jeff, when you were saying that the numbers would change if we do um, income verification, does that mean like ridership would go down so cost would go down or which direction would we see there? Yeah, I, I think there could be some ridership um, drops, but also potentially some uh, some cost, you know, staffing, we may not need as much staff, uh, vehicle costs could go down. And I think, uh, you know, just the verification process is going to, to need some thought. You know, I'm not sure how easy it's going to be to do income verification with an Uber or Lyft. Um, probably can be done, but um, it, it, it may be a lot easier with a, a third party provider like uh, um, like Seats or, or um, Horizons. So I think we just need to sort through some of that. Yeah, I guess I'm not particularly comfortable with the thought right now of using 
Lyft or Uber, not because they're not reasonable, but because we're talking about uh, people's personal vehicles. We don't know what the safe what the safety is. Um, these are these are gig workers, and um, I wish they had benefits and so forth. But I feel much more comfortable if we're working with other organizations that have um, that have trained drivers, and and we essentially know more about their their how they're employed and so forth. I agree with uh, Councillor Weiner. I'm I'm not, as you can look back on the records, not a fan of of the NTS, Lyft or Uber. Uh, they've got many issues over the time. Uh, you can look it up. You can you can find that out. Uh, uh, so I'm I'm just not a fan uh, of them, and and would prefer using local, like the yellow cab or whatever cab system might be uh, in, available in the community. I totally respect your comments in in relationship to. Um, Lyft and Uber. I just wanted to mention that many of the drivers are local work, um, are local people that work for these companies, and sometimes it's probably the only work available for them. Um, Lyft and Uber. I've talked to several people. It really is a, a lifeline for many, and so I would just want you all to just keep bear that in mind um, as we move forward with you know just talking about the options. That's true. A lot of That's immigrants are Uber driver, and uh, they complain that there is no a lot of work in this community, so they don't make uh, make as much as like taxis or any other uh, get transportation companies. So I I don't know, but maybe we need to consider them. Those are good points. Thank you. Is there any other thing that um, staff need from council from for now? No, I think I have what I need. Unless um, Jeff, you have any other comments? No, just to confirm though, it seems like at least a majority of folks are are okay with us moving forward on the Sunday service two year pilot, the fixed route option. Okay. All right, we thought that'd be the case. Um, we'll get we'll get going on that, and then we'll refine some options for you. Uh, your comments tonight have been helpful, so we'll we'll refine some options and and present those to you soon. Thanks to uh, Darian. Thank you for being here, and of course our city manager. He's always here, right? <laughs> All right, we will move on to the next agenda item which is the discussion on alcohol allowances in city park shelters. Um, is Darian, Julie here? Oh. Yeah, Darian, if you wouldn't yeah. mind to stop sharing your screen, we'll you got, Give me one moment here. Sure. Thanks for the reminder. While she's doing that, just by way of introduction, for some of you, you'll remember this item. It came up in, in 2017. Uh, the council did approve the first two readings of it and then deferred the, the third reading um, uh, indefinitely. So um, we, are, we have really uh, just kind of dusted off the old um, uh, staff reports and we included those in the packet. Uh, we don't have a presentation tonight, but Julie's here to answer any questions about how it would work in the park system and what other communities uh, around us do. I do wonder if um, just for the sake of the public, um, if, if there could just be a, a synopsis of what this would mean for the parks, what sure. will be allowed so currently in our park system, the only places you can have alcohol are within the Terry Trueblood Lodge and the Ashton House and the Riverside Festival stage, um, or if it's a city sponsored or partner sponsored event um, that gets a special alcohol license. So in general, no alcohol use is allowed throughout the park system. Um, this would allow alcohol use within the parks if groups have a shelter rental um, and it would be 
only during the rental and on the premises of the actual park shelter. Um, and we were, we are um, recommending no additional fee or permit for that. Um, we had talked about that at one point, um, but then felt that there weren't any additional costs so that it didn't make as much sense to have additional fees. We would ask uh, shelter rentals to let us know if they plan to serve alcohol on the application for the shelter permit. Um, so we could let police know when those rentals were happening. Um, but it would be pretty simple. And is this the, the recommendation is still, or the vote is still limited to beer and wine, is that correct? Correct, uh, beer and wine, no sales, um, no keg alcohol, no alcohol and kegs. They did at the time in 2017, um, the proposal was to allow smaller kegs or like pony kegs um, or growlers. Um, so if a group wanted to get beer from one of the local, um, sorry, one of the local breweries, they could do that. It, will you repeat that last part? What can they get from a local sure. brewery? So if they wanted a growler, uh, just enough beer that's in a growler, that would be allowed. That is currently allowed at Terry True Blood Lodge and the Ashton House. Um, and we decided not to allow at youth sports complexes. So not at Napoleon softball complex or kickers soccer fields. We uh, updated the information recently from other cities and other large cities around the state do a whole range of options from a few that allow alcohol anywhere in the parks with no restrictions um, to just one that we found that said absolutely no alcohol. Um, so there's word. Thank you. Thoughts from counselors? I know there's new ones. I wasn't a part of the 2017 discussion and either was Mayor Pro Tem uh, or our Burgess or Weiner. I, I was part of that discussion and, and I, I still, I believe that uh, making allowances for the use of alcohol in our parks would provide a system with which uh, we could monitor that use because we have to admit, we, we know uh, that it already happens, uh, but by having an application process with perhaps some rules and guidelines attached, we'd be providing for uh, the safe use of alcohol in, in our parks um, with a system that maybe monitors the use such as uh, guidelines for who would be monitoring uh, access to the alcohol, uh, and perhaps even the size of the groups that would be allowed. Uh, which on, on that respect, I think it's a, it's a good opportunity uh, to provide for uh, persons to have an affordable option for, for a venue, for special events. I think um, Susan maybe originally had gotten a letter regarding someone wanted to have a wedding reception there, because as we know, a lot of venues uh, in the community are, are very expensive, uh, but this would maybe provide an option for those folks who, who can't afford that, uh, but would like to have a, a gathering after, after their special event. So um, I'm in favor of it. I was in favor of it but three years ago, um, and I'm, I'm still in favor of it. I, I do think, as Pauline mentioned, the, yeah, we, 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 the drinking is already taking place in our parks. So it's, it's an existing use that, that based on, on the comments from when we reviewed this before, it doesn't appear to be um, a, a significantly disruptive uh, activity. Uh, I was impressed in reading the minutes from from those previous meetings that you know this had the full support of the police department as well. Um, so it, it seems to me uh, the, the the permitting through the shelters does provide a kind of a filter uh, of the use, which is useful. I think it does put some a framework around it, which helps with the enforcement. Um, and I, I do think it's something I just think personally, uh, you know, 
that I, I can I can well imagine events where it would be nice to have that opportunity uh, in the public parks uh, that we have. One one thought I did have uh, that I at least wasn't noted in the minutes. I don't think I, I mentioned it before, and that is. I do think it may be helpful at the parks to post park rules so that uh, the, the public, I don't know that the public has a clear understanding of what, how we control drinking in our, in our park system. So to have at the parks some indication by way of park rules uh, as to what the, you know, what the framework is for drinking in our parks, I think that would help um, provide provide some information for those who may not, you know, just may not understand because they may make their own assumptions. Um, so I, I do think it might be useful to have uh, some park rules, which of course could include other issues as well. I've been getting uh, correspondence on off-leash dogs, things of that sort. Um, so the, the park rules might be helpful uh, in, a, in a variety of ways in which we can better communicate to the community what what the expectations are. I wanted to just um, highlight something that I heard both um, Councillor Taylor and Thomas talk about, and that is we know that this is already happening in our parks, where people are, you know, partaking um, in alcohol beverages, and so for me, I know that this is limited to the shelters. But I wonder if um, there is any interest in expanding this um, just within the parks. I know that's not the recommendation um, at this time um, from staff, unless they wish to comment on it. Um, but I wonder if there's any interest in expanding this uh, conversation to just allow it within the parks um, and talk about any concerns there. I would just start by saying I was a part of this three years ago and I agreed with the proposal then. I think it was very well vetted by the Parks and Rec Commission. Uh, I think the council in general was very supportive of it. Um, I think it's a, a reasonable request when people are using the shelters. Um, regarding the mayor's comments just now, I would not at this point be in favor of expanding it beyond the shelters. I think you run into an issue with softball and baseball games and other activities where people are out there for longer periods of time of it ending up being a more um, problematic practice. So if we're gonna make any changes right now, I would encourage us to go just with the shelters. I would just jump in and say that in general, uh, park staff, police staff, everyone involved with this is still very much in favor of allowing alcohol in the parks as the park shelters. We haven't really asked the question about uh, whether they would want it throughout the parks. Um, we do know it, it is there now. Um, our anecdotal evidence of cleaning out garbage cans throughout all the parks would tell you that um, people are drinking alcohol in, in all areas of the park. Um, but yes, staff is supportive of it and doesn't see any um, additional issues that might be caused if it's allowed with park shelter rentals. I guess when you say like uh, in another side of the park, not the shelter, I know that if somebody want to rent the shelter, they will come to you and they ask you and they have the permission. But sometimes people just like go there on the park only, not like the shelter. Do you think uh, is that means they can just have it over there? Or I, I really don't understand how this is going to be working. So this ordinance would allow it only if there is a park shelter rental yeah. and very clearly only on the pr premise of the shelter, like to the edge of the cement <laughs> around each shelter. Um, so I think that alcohol used in other areas or when there isn't a park shelter rental would be handled like it is now, which is only on a complaint basis. And mm -hmm. I'm not sure we've had any complaints in the last few summers um, about this. So. so, and it sounded like from what I read, because clearly I was not here last time this was discussed, that 
uh, this is relatively common practice in other cities in the state? Is it? Correct. Um, as we updated our survey of other large cities in the state of Iowa, Council Bluffs is the only one that we found that did not allow it except like at our Terry Trubut Lodge inside an indoor facility. Um, Ankeny allows it just in general throughout the parks with no restrictions. Um, Ames is any community park, so any of their larger system parks it's allowed in, including youth athletic complexes. Um, and you get a little bit of a, a mixture throughout all. Most do not require separate permits other than uh, park shelter rental. Um, and most do not allow it in youth sports in one way or another. I guess one of the questions um, facing council tonight is, um, it, it sounds like there is agreement from the majority of council to move forward with the current um, park shelters, alcohol and park shelters. <clears throat> Do we want to continue and go with the third reading, which would be the final vote, or do we want to reset it all and go through three readings? I think that's a question that we should probably ask. I think given the time frame since the last time this was in front of council, it would probably be more prudent to go through all through go through all three readings just to make sure the public is aware of it. I know it delays it, but we're I think we've got time to get that done before there's a whole lot of use of the shelters. Um, I would really I would really prefer to avoid having people um, constituents say that we that we didn't they didn't know or they didn't have time to comment or they didn't have they just didn't have a chance to react. So um, I would agree with Councillor Mims. I'm seeing some shaking of heads. So then we'll go through, we'll we'll put this on the agenda and it will just be for the shelters, um, alcohol in the shelters. Okay, it, you need anything else from us? All right, great. Personally, I'll be back after we try out the shelters and, <laughs> and, and, and get a report how we're doing. All right. We're gonna move on with clarification of agenda items. Uh, Mayor, if I may clarify one item, I had a, a message from one counselor and just in case others noticed this, in um, the consent calendar, you have um, the uh, tentative agreements with our AFSCME unions, both transit and, and the mixed um, unit. Um, the, which we're, we're asking you to vote on is just the tentative agreement. We included some actual contract language in there that just, uh, we, we were trying to show you the prohibited subjects um, that now have to be removed from that, from that uh, bargaining language, but that is not the contract that you're voting on. Um, it was pointed out that the Juneteenth holiday wasn't mentioned um, in, the, in the contract language and we approved that through a side letter with the with the union last year. So it will become contract language and you will vote on the actual language in, in a couple of months. But for now, you're just you're just um, basically uh, voting on that general framework of an agreement that we reached with AFSCME. And so this year, 2021, Juneteenth will be celebrated because of that side agreement. Yes, with all with all city employee groups. Great, awesome, great, thank you. Any other items for clarification? Moving on to info packet, uh, February 18th. And I know there's a little, I need to switch screens here. Hearing none, we'll go to, oh, go right ahead. I was just being slow. Um, 
IP2, the affordable housing market analysis, I thought was had some really fascinating information and definitely worth the time to, to look at that and kind of try and chew on it. Just a couple of things that really struck me. So this, you know, a lot of it was framed as the comparison of the, the five-year period from 2014 to 2018 and seeing the the rental vacancy rate for example in 2019 you know shooting up i think from now i just lost my page i think it was like 8% up to 17 plus 17.7% 17 um in sorry that was in tiffin in iowa city it was it just is at 4.1% in 2019 and i just think when we're talking about all the the student housing and um market saturation and that kind of thing like just seeing the difference between the communities and you know i had this perception like we have so much extra housing and all of this is coming online so understanding that some of that's changed in the last year too but like um i don't know i just thought that was really helpful to have the actual data in front of us and see it in comparison of different communities within johnson county um and then also there was uh Proportion of cost burden renters, again, with the comparison by jurisdiction, which I noted, and if I read this correctly, that Iowa City is the only jurisdiction where both the overall cost burdened and those that are severely cost burdened had decreased in that time period. Now we still carry a, a high percentage of severely cost burdened renter rental households which of course we're trying to address, but just really happy to see data so that when we have our conversations about affordable housing, we have context such as this. Thanks for those comments, Councilor Burgers. I was a little slow on that too. And I had spent a lot of time going through that um, document. There is a lot of really good information in there. And then also IP3, our fourth quarter update on social and social justice and racial equity. Uh, there's always a lot of good things in there in terms of what the city and our staff are doing. So encourage people to take a few minutes to look at that if they haven't had a chance to. Any other comments? We're going to go to info packet for February 25th. Um, there's two items that we do want to go through. Um, but maybe before we go there, are there any other items that council want to discuss? I just wanna, because I don't see Divey in my computer somehow, I couldn't open them. Uh, I just wanna ask you if there is the, one of the, the water shut off is one of those IVs or not? Because I, I, I asked the city manager last time if we can talk about them. There's, there's nothing in the IP related to the water shutoffs, but I, there's, our okay. discussion was to place that on the March 16th agenda with the hopes that the state program, the state relief program information would be known by then. Okay, but if you can just give us update about what, because last, last thing that we talked about was uh, starting uh, uh, sending all this to collection to start March 1st, people receiving uh, no, you know, letter to their home that they will be sent uh, starting March 1st. They will, uh, the, this uh, past due balance will be sent to collection. So if you can just tell us what uh, the, you know, what the idea will be until March, between now and March so, March 15th. So I think respectfully, we have to wait until the next meeting, but we did discuss about this being on the March 16th meeting. No, I, I, I can oh, give just. No, a... you didn't understand what I'm saying, Meyer. Oh. Uh, I, I, I was saying, families receive that their water, uh, their bus due balance, and we agree that could be March first. And now we have the state coming, and we're gonna discuss this on the 15th. Is the city going to proceed? I want the public to know. Is the city going to proceed with the collection on March first? as they stated in the letter that has been sent to families or not? Uh, Mayor, I, I think I can answer this because uh, there is an item on your agenda tonight from the HCDC um, 
commission about uh, shutoffs. So I'll use that uh, uh, as the basis for being able to respond tonight. Um, uh, the, uh, as you recall, back in November, uh, we outlined kind of the return to normal collection process uh, with the council. Uh, you had uh, approved that and it did include um, sending um, past due balances to collections as of March 1st. Um, however, when we became aware that the state was going to issue a large relief program, uh, staff pressed pause on that plan. So we have not transferred any accounts over to collections because we wanna make sure that that would not um, eliminate uh, someone's eligibility for that program. Um, letters did go out because those letters were being crafted before the state program was, was really being put together. So in January, February, we had letters go out to let people know that they were gonna be moved to collections. Um, but as of this time, um, we have decided to hold um, moving anybody over to collections until we know the exact rules of the state program, which we hope to in the next couple of weeks. Um, and I think once we know those rules, we can have another conversation with you at, at city council, which is why we're tentatively planning to have that on March 16th. Sure. So as of right now, nothing's that. changed. Yes, that's what the update I'm looking for because I know that by talking to you, but the public doesn't know about it. Thank you. Yeah, I think it'd be good to have that discussion with more details, <laughs> how to play out in our community on the 16th. So thanks for that. Any other item um, from the 25th before we go to uh, the two items that we need to address? So we'll go ahead and start with the um, IP6. I would make the suggestion on that one that we delegate that responsibility to sit on that advisory board to a staff member. Um, and the reason I recommend that is I've been sitting on the committee, the executive committee for the GuideLink Center for, I don't know, the last two or three years. I can't remember how long it's been. And I will tell you, there's, I think, a fair amount of complexity that goes with you know, what has been developed there. And I think as that gets up and running, that advisory committee may or may not have a fair amount of influence and, and questions brought to it on how things are going to operate and the coordination with the municipality. And quite frankly, I think it could be a lot more efficient potentially to have a staff member who is more in tune with how staff is working um, and have that continuity than to necessarily have an elected official. So I would recommend that we have staff do it. I agree with Councillor Mims on that. I think uh, for consistency also, it, it would be a good idea and for the complexity of the issues that they'll be dealing with. So I, I would agree that a, a staff member uh, should sit on that. Any other thoughts? I'm seeing some shaking of heads in agreement. Okay, all right. Um, staff will be, we'll need staff on there. So, all right. Um, IP7, which is the memo from our city clerk. Kelly. Yeah, just looking to see if anybody has any conflicts with those dates um, on the memo. And then also I, I did reach out and was trying to schedule a special work session for March. I unsuccessfully found a day where everybody could come. <laughs> so I don't know if we want to try again and look at early April or, or suggestions. Kelly, were either, was I the only, for example, was I the only one that couldn't make one of those Tuesdays? No. Okay. I was going to say, because I, oh. if I had to, I could <laughs> arrange my schedule. If I was the, if I was the major or the only conflict there, I could, could make a change. No, we, we weren't, I don't think even close. Okay. Okay. 
have you proposed the 23rd? Um, and I don't know, Jeff, if that was one of the days that didn't work for you. You're on mute. Listed, I could, uh, I, I can make that, I, I can make that work. If that wasn't an option. If it will work for everyone, because I know that I have only one day I will work for me, but I just have that cleared out today. The meeting I have on that day has been canceled. 23rd works for me. It, it would depend on what time because there's I have a conference I have to attend for my other work that week that runs generally between 11 and 4 and I might be able to get out early, but that's my challenge that week. I'm free that day. We're talking just about the 23rd of March. I can make that work. Yeah, if everybody else can, I can rearrange my schedule. And are we four o'clock or is that pushing it, Janice, for? Everything is virtual still, so that's fine. Is that four o'clock work for everybody else to start at that time? Yeah. Okay, okay so four, four o'clock on the 23rd. Thank you. And then the rest of the schedule, tentative schedule looked okay. Okay, thank you. All right. Any other items from the um, February 25th? Hearing none, and it sounds like our um, May through August schedule will be just the typical two, uh, first and third Tuesdays. All right. Council updates on assigned boards, commissions, and committees. I'm hearing none. All right, well, we will be back at 7 p.m. Signing out of this Zoom link into a, a new Zoom link for our 7 p.m. formal meeting. See you all soon.